Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling Applied Multivariate Analysis. And we're in Chapter 5, part of this playlist, which I'm calling Comparing Population Means. And let's jump right to today's topic, which is the MANOVA statistics. Now, this is Part 2 of MANOVA. In Part 1, we kind of gave a heuristic argument of what's going on in ANOVA. And now we're going to review the four tests, four common tests in MANOVA. So the first one is Wilkes and the oldest and first of the MANOVA tests. And recall we want to test that the null hypothesis is that the mean vectors are all equal. The population mean vectors are equal. The alternative is at least two are different. And then in part one, we develop the notation of the E matrix, which stands for air. It's kind of a within covariance of each population. And H is the, they, they call it the hypothesis matrix. It's kind of like the between variability or the between covariance of all the populations. And the determinant deals with volume of the, you know, some sort of transformation. And so if the variances are large between variants, then this determinant of this bottom is going to dominate this the, this fraction, which is, going to, which is going to make it small. So what I said there, <clears throat> if all the means, population mean vectors are equal, then H tends to go to zero. There's no variance or covariance between them. So then this ratio becomes one, and we don't reject. On the other hand, if the mu's are spread far apart, then this value goes to zero. And so we reject the null hypothesis if lambda is too small. And so there's a critical value, and they're tabled in some book, I'm sure, some multivariate book that you have to look up. And, the, and it's uh, derived off P, which is the, the uh, how many parameters we have in our vector, how many variables, and then the degrees of freedom associated with H, degrees of freedom associated with E. That's a Greek letter nu. Now, it can be shown that if we look at the eigenvalues of this matrix product between the error matrix and the hypothesis matrix, then uh, Wilkes lambda is equivalent to this product, where it's 1 divided by 1 plus lambda i. It's the product of those. And usually, this is a pretty complicated distribution, and it only has tabled values for sort of relatively small numbers. And so it's usually transformed to an approximate F test. Now the second statistic called Roy's largest root test, I want to give an illustration of what's going on. We're not going to review the R code, but I'll, as always, I'll paste in the comment section if you want to review it. So this is in two dimensions, but really this could be more, you know, P equals more than two. But if we have uh, three populations, and I'm going to call them green, blue, and red, and when you plot them, they sort of look like this. Now, if we were to shove these down into the first dimension, first component, we get little normal distributions like this. And there's a lot of overlap there. Now, if we were to shove them towards this direction in the second component, there's there's a, even probably a little more overlap between them. You can't really tell the difference between these. But maybe if we kind of compress them or shove them in a different directions, then there's an optimal way to make the differences as, as great as possible. So think of this arrow as rotating, you know, it's rotating up and rotating down. And then in some direction, if we were to shove the, say, this red one, you know, up and down or compress it to this line, and then compress blue to this line, compress green to this line, notice there's no overlap. So it's easy to distinguish between these two or these three uh, population, you know, and these populations. You know, and the mean of the blue would be here, the mean of the red here. Anyway, so there's some sort of optimal direction that we need to sort of shove or compress these down into. Not the first component, not the second. And anyway, so that's what Roy's test does, okay? Even though it's kind of hard to tell from this <laughs> test statistic, uh, Roy's largest root test is this. So it's um, 
lambda 1 over 1 plus lambda 1. And, and so where lambda 1 is the largest eigenvalue of this matrix product, E is the error matrix, the inverse of the error matrix, and the hypothesis matrix. Now, if theta is too large, then we reject. And the rejection region is, you know, it's a function of the dimensions P and the degrees of freedom associated with H, you know, and you can kind of see it there. Now, the eigenvector, let's call it A1, corresponding to the eigenvalue, lambda 1, is what's called the discriminant function. And so if we transform our data by using this vector, this vector product, A1, you know, A1 transpose into a new Z, this is the best, this is the function that best separates the transformed means. And so this little uh, linear uh, combination you know, what we call the discriminant function, which we'll actually uh, delve into, I think, next chapter. That's really what's going on here. And then it ends up being equal to this. And so, but it's a complicated distribution and it's usually transformed into an approximate F test. Now, the third test we're going to look at is a Pillay's, Pillay's, and I apologize if I'm butchering that name, Pillay's Trace. Play, play eyes, play eyes. Um, it's given by this. It's the sum of this. Now notice that these lambda values are eigenvalues. And here in, in Roy's root, we use just lambda 1. In this test statistic, we use the sum of all of them of that function. It ends up being the trace of this uh, matrix here. And that's it. And so that's Roy's test. And if it's too large, if V is too large, then we reject. And this is really an extension of Roy's test. Now, Roy's test is so powerful in a certain alternative hypothesis. So if all the um, means lie in one direction, then Roy's test is very powerful. But that's rarely the case. And so it, Roy's test ends up not being very useful in most situations. But this one does. Ply's test is, is in generally much more powerful. Ends up being R's default function or default test for MANOVA. And again, it's usually transformed into an approximate F test. Now, Lolly and Hotelling's trace. Um, this statistic is given by this. So again, it's the trace of this matrix product, which is the, and, and as we remember, the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues associated with that, this matrix. Um, we reject um, for large values of the t this statistic. Now, if, uh, and there's, there's tabled values of the critical regions, but again, it's pretty complicated and you have to have a table to do it but the nice thing is that this is a, really a generalization of hotel and t squared statistic for more than two groups and again it's usually transformed to an approximate f test um, what i find very fascinating is the calculation of that if there's two populations then the lolly hotel and test which ends up being just one eigenvalue, so it's lambda one. That eigenvalue is a hundred percent hotel and t squared statistic, and so it's kind of fascinating to go back and forth between the, the, this one eigenvalue and hotel and t squared, which we did in uh, earlier in this chapter. Um, so, as a brief summary, is this: we have the eigenvalues ordered of this matrix product, error, inverse of the error matrix times the hypothesis matrix, which we did in part one. Um, the Wilkes lambda is the product of these, this fraction, these eigenvalues. Roy's largest is just using the uh, lambda one, the largest eigenvalue. And in general, this shouldn't be used because it ends up not being very powerful, except in the specific case that they li all lie in the same uh, dimension or the same um, 
direction. Uh, Wilkes Lambda is historically the first one to be driven. It's still often used. It's actually related to the, the likelihood ratio test, so it's still very powerful. Uh, Pillai's trace is the default R test for MANOVA, and it's, it has been shown to be pretty darn robust to the violations to the assumption. So even if, if the violations are not 100% met, this still is a quite powerful test, and Lawley's hotel lines is the sum of these eigenvalues. Okay, so we're right at 10 minutes. I'm going to stop. The next video, part three, I'm going to do an R illustration of these four tests and how to uh, calculate them. Um, that's all I have for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.